with demand expected to come back. But the question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Rich, I got to thank you. You know, for the past two weeks, I was out in the Colorado mountains, really, really enjoying it. Uh, trying to have a, a non-electronic uh, couple of weeks, trying to stay away from the laptop and the, uh, and the cell phone. It wasn't, it wasn't quite possible, but uh, at least I really got some wonderful downtime out on the rivers, the Arkansas, the great Arkansas River, the great Colorado River. Uh, I, I did something for the first time, and, and I've rafted a lot. I, I love rafting, but I actually went down the rapids in a kayak, and I watched these people do it before, and I say, those people are absolutely crazy going down rapids in a kayak. But somehow I got the courage up, and I did it, and it was incredibly exhilarating. You know, when you're on a raft, you, the guy that's in the back, you know, he's doing all the, the sort of directing of the raft, and, you know, you do this and do that, and, I, and he tells you to paddle right, paddle left, and, and so on. And, and I think it's more for show because he's really controlling the raft. But when you're on a kayak, it's, it's only you, you know, and you're making a line, and you're saying, wow, should I go over that or should I not go over that? But um, I, you had a couple of really great shows, man. I'm really proud, man. You did a wonderful, wonderful job. Maybe you don't need me around here anymore. Well, we were thinking about bringing some dogs in. We were going to have, a, you know, it was National Dog Day in the last week. So we thought about flooding your office with dogs, and I decided against that. Well, thank you for that. Out of deference to you. Because the office looks great. But, yeah, it does. It's very clean. It's, it's, <laughs> it's terrific. No, we had, we had good shows. We had good people. We had great conversation. Um, I mean, you can't miss, but this is been in a crazy news time, you know, the news weeks, the news uh, that's out there on a daily basis, almost hourly with the Biden administration, uh, is just incredible. And I think we have a great show today. Yes, we do. We have an incredible show, so much to talk about. And we're going to be hearing from some really spectacular people. And you're going to hear also some sound bites today, uh, some of the commentary that's been going on. Uh, and we're going to discuss that as well. But first, we're very pleased to have with us Tom Jones, who is the co-founder of the American Accountability Foundation. Tom, welcome to Made in America. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I really look forward to talking. So, so Tom, the radical left is really at it again. You know, they've introduced a bill that would, uh, that would essentially change American industry. I, massively change is probably a better word. In, in fact, maybe even a better, better word would be eliminate American industry uh, with, with go what bigger than doing. That. Go bigger than that. Use the word economy. Well, OK, well, well eliminate economy. Well, if you eliminate American yeah. industry, you eliminate the economy. I mean, there, it's just going to be impossible for any sort of large scale and, and medium and small scale uh, manufacturing to be done in this country. What are they up to this time? Yeah, no, and I think you hit it right on the head. Uh, you know, they're not very coy about what they're talking about doing. They want to transform America. They, they're just not satisfied with the America that you know depends on individual initiative and, and hard work and, and people building businesses for their own. So what they're talking about here with this Civilian Climate Corps is 1.5 million people going door to door working to implement a, a radical leftist agenda. You know, they're modeling it on this 1930s era Civilian Conservation Corps, which was explicitly a make work program. This was just like, we don't have jobs for people. We're going to create government jobs for them doing things. That's exactly what they want to do here. But what they're, what they're going to do that's really pernicious is they're going to, they're going to send these folks door to door to implement a, a really a, a radical agenda that's out of step with what most people in America care about, what the values of most Americans are. It's really a, a fundamental departure from what we understand the role of government to be. Um, and, and there's some really some problematic groups associated with it. And, and the, the part that's also concerning to me is they're going to send some of this money to illegal aliens, which is really troubling for me. 
Well, I, I think what's really trouble. I agree with everything you're saying, and what troubles me dramatically is that when you look at the, you just said it, the groups that are associating that would get billions, not millions, billions of dollars will go to these far left groups that start always start with the peoples. You know, the peoples. I thought that was something out of you know Manchurian Candidate, the People's Party of China. So it kind of worries me that, you know, we seem to be going in that direction, which is not, they're not even hiding the fact that they want to go in, 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 a, in a Marxist socialist direction with this money. Yeah. And it, it does radically change where we're going. But, you know, ha, but how did they get there? I want to get back for a second. That we're really talking about, to a great degree, climate. Climate seems to be the common denominator by which, through which, upon which, in the form that they discuss, everything that goes forward with this country and, and belittle everything else that's out, outside of it. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. But I think that the other important thing you need to keep in mind about the left is this concept of intersectionality for them. You know, for us, you know, maybe we care about military issues. Maybe we care about social issues. Maybe something's really important to us. But, like, not every issue is about everything else. For the left, it's this concept of everything's intertwined. So racism, environmentalism, um, you know, pro-abortion groups, it's all one comprehensive history of, of oppression in America. Everything's tied together. So that's why you got things like the Movement for Black Lives, Sierra Club, People's Action, all of these radical leftist groups coalescing around this civilian climate core to use the the 132 billion with a B, 132 billion dollars in salaries and tuition for these people to go knocking door to door to implement this agenda. That's why they all come to the table under this. They like the climate side of it because it's butterflies and sunshine. Well, who doesn't love you know green spaces and solar panels and all that stuff? But what it's really about is closing down prison, enacting a, a radical agenda, pushing critical race theory, you know, making people feel guilty about driving cars. And then it's all rolled together. That's why you have all these radical groups at the table trying to get their little portion of the of the hundred and thirty two billion dollars and the one point five million jobs. Well, you know, it, it's amazing because you, they also talk about climate equity, that it's very unfair for certain you know folks in the United States to be suffering from a hurricane, whereas the wealthy people, the white oppressors, you know, uh, are not going to suffer as much as a result of that. I mean, it is it is right out of a Marxist you know, divide and conquer uh, handbook, sort of like Cloward and Piven. So, yeah, and that's, you know, the, the impact on, on, you know, low income communities in America is going to be profound. I, you know, I don't know about you, but if I've lived in inner city Baltimore, I can't afford a Tesla. And that's what, the, that's where these folks are going. They're going to electrification. So you're going to have to buy these cars that you can't afford. They're trying to decarbonize America. Well, that's going to be pretty rough if you live in New England, where you heat your house with home heating, heating oil. How are you going to heat your house with renewable energy powering a heat pump that's going to be incredibly expensive and you know that all has an impact when you when you have to pay higher electric bills you can't say, you know you have to take that out of your kids college fund you have to take that out of your savings for a new home you have to take that out of the money you're going to use to start a bit start a business you know those folks don't think about it because they, they have these constituencies they care about and they have this agenda they want to drive they don't think about the downstream impact of these things like decarbonization and electrification of of vehicles it's it's really it's, it's very troubling. Yeah. So that so that brings me back to the the whole energy policy, and what should the energy policy of this country be? Let's face it. So many jobs are created there. Uh, our uh, American entrepreneurs in the energy segment uh, of our economy has really made profound uh, advancements, not only for us but for all good people around the world. Uh, and, and think about the jobs and the small businesses and everybody that's employed in our energy segment. And yet and, and, and they want us to just shut it down. I mean, it's just like, you know, part of it is decarbonizing the economy, like you just said, leading to the pro prohibition of the internal combustion engine. I mean, imagine what that would do and how many jobs is at stake there. Absolutely insane. Um, well, Tom, I want you to listen to a, uh, a soundbite of former Secretary of Energy Rick Perry on Biden's energy policy, because this is really at the core. It, it is stunning, Sean, to see how fast we went from energy independence uh, to now relying on countries like Iran to get our energy. But you think about where we were, the work that we did, the Americans that we put to work, whether it was building pipelines, good union jobs, uh, building pipelines all across the country, stopping that Keystone 
uh, uh, pipeline uh, out of Canada, and then allowing the Russians to finish the Nord Stream 2. I mean, it, it, it just makes absolutely no sense. So, Tom, I comment on him because, I mean, this is really at yeah. the core, right? This is at the core. Great jobs, good jobs being thrown out the window. For what? Well, exactly. To, to drive a wedge between communities in America is what it's about. It's, you know, it's red state communities where we're developing energy like natural gas. We're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Like it, and what they want to do is they want to shut down an industry partially because they don't like the people in those communities. And, and it's terrible because, you know, half the world is heating its home with literally cow dung and wood. If we were able to export more natural gas in, in quantities to communities around the world where they could heat their homes with natural gas and, instead of, you know, wood, the health benefits would be profound. But they want to crush that industry because they don't like the places it's come from. They don't like the people that work in that industry. Um, and, you know, they want to go on some goofy leftist adventure with windmills and solar panels. Um, that just isn't going to cut it. You're just not going to be able to do the type of things that you need to do with energy, relying on windmills and solar panels. Well, you, you know, there, there's, a, there's a history for this. Back in the 70s, when we had the first OPEC problem and, and gasoline and oil went through the roof, you know, I lived in upstate New York at the time, and everyone did oil heat. Oil quadrupled in price. And, and not only that, it was a time in America that everybody was switching from oil heat to electric that it was supposed to be built better with electricity. And, and all these electrified homes for heating, and the heats were, they were in the, in, the, in the floor, Neil. They were in the floor. They would heat going up, you know, from the floor. Well, all those homes, the electric bills, you know, also quadrupled. And they couldn't pay their electric bills anymore. Forget about eating. But they couldn't pay the electric bills anymore. So imagine, imagine what would happen if we make this switch from fossil to only electric and there's no fallback. Take it hey, from here. Hey, Tom, uh, yeah. we're, we're going to have to take a quick break, and we'll get you to comment on that here just in a second. But, folks, you're listening to Tom Jones, co-founder of the American Accountability Foundation, together with Dr. Rich Rothman and myself, Neil Asbury. We're going to be right back. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we're joined by Tom Jones, co-founder of the American Accountability Foundation. So, so Tom, I mean, it's all connected, right? I mean, the unintended yeah. consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go get rid of all this. We're going to get rid of all of that. We're going to get rid of all that. And the people to suffer, you know, I mean, prices are going to go up and they're going to go up astronomically for those most basic things like energy. And as Rich said, I mean, heating one's home, you know, and what's it going to cost to heat a home? I mean, you're just not going to be able to afford it. I mean, the technology, um, it's great. We can have all renewable energy and all of this. Everybody's for that. But, you know, it's going to take some time, you know, to get it to where it's affordable. And, um, you know, hey, look, let's take that time. Let's do it responsibly. But that's not what the radical left wants to do. I mean, they just want to just, like, unplug America and, like, you know, <laughs> damn the torpedoes, let it fall where it may. Yeah, they well, you know what? Blow it all up. Blow you know, it up. This is, let's this. just blow up the country. This is how they're going to find out. Tom, you got to listen. I want your comment on this. You know, if over the last decade or so, you know, the electric companies, like down here in Florida, it's Florida Power and Light, huge company, Next Era Energy owns them. And, and they've been putting in, Tom, you know, this smart, sm smart meters. You yep. know, the smart meters are read on any given time by FP&L. They, somebody out there, you know, probably George Soros. Somebody out there knows if you're taking a long, long shower because you're going to use a lot of hot water, your electric bill is going to go up. Or they're going to know if you're heating too much. Or they're going to know if you're cooling too much. Tom, this is such big brotherism. Wait till people had a knock on the door and they say, hello, we're the Climate Corps. And we found out, yep. uh, by the way, put your towel on. We found out that uh, <laughs> you're, you're taking a long shower. That's not going to work yeah, too well. I don't see any solar panels on your roof. And, oh, by the way, when our friend was in your kid's classroom, he told me that uh, you guys left the lights on last night and didn't turn them off when you went to sleep. Like, that's exactly, that's exactly what they're going to do with this climate court. Energy audits that, that are explicitly part of this bill, and that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have these, you know, I, I liken it to the old D.A.R.E. program when, you, when we were in uh, 
in high school back in the day where you like you were supposed to rat out your parents and your friends. That's what we're going to have here is is a a group of like government funded busybodies who are going to harass kids and parents into shaming them about, you know, using home heating oil or not having solar panel or, you know, driving an older car that doesn't have an, an electric motor in it. Um, it's just, I mean, well, it's just fundamentally un-American. Um, and and that's, that's, there's a whole bunch of reasons to be bothered by it. But having one, one and a half million people going door to door saying, hey, you know, you need, to, you need to rethink your energy consumption and you need to uh, put in these really expensive light bulbs and you need to do all these different things that you can't afford to do. Um, that's not what America is supposed to be about. And that's not how we're supposed to be neighbors. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons this bill is terrible, but it's, you know, that part really bothers me as well. And sending these kids into school to indoctrinate young people into radical environmentalism is, uh, is just, again, wrong. We should be focused on teaching kids math and engineering and science. And That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a great that's idea, stuff. you know, so they can do something. Hey, 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 uh, uh, Tom and Rich, let's, let's listen to another soundbite here, and we're going to pivot a little bit, and we're going to talk about building an America better, building America better that competes with the rest of the world. This is our president. This is President Biden commenting on that. Very wealthy. They can still make a lot of money, but just begin to pay their fair share. So we can invest in making our country stronger and more competitive, create jobs and raise wages, and lift up the standard of living for everyone. The bottom line is, in my view, we're a step closer to truly investing in the American people, positioning our economy for long-term growth, and building an America that outcompetes the rest of the world. So, Tom, outcompeting the rest of the world. How, how does that happen? Know, what, what does he mean? Because he's going to take all of the, all of the, the, the wealth or the, or the, or the resources, the, the financial resources from the most productive part of our economy, our yep. entrepreneurs and our small businesses, our inventors, our risk takers, and he's going to give that to the most most unproductive part of our economy, exactly. uh, like the, the, the government, right, from the most productive yeah, to the most is. unproductive. And that somehow is going to build America back better and we're going to compete with the world better. I, I, I don't get yeah, that. This is, yeah, this is exactly the kind of economic development plan you would expect from someone who's never signed the front of a check. This is a guy who's collected a government paycheck his whole life. You know who creates jobs in America? People who are willing to take risks, people who are willing to open a business, put their life savings on the line to pursue a dream and employ their neighbors and do something creative and new. That's, how, that's who's going to build back America is people, people going out and saying, I got a great idea. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to make this place better. And I'm going to hire all, all my neighbors in, in high paying, interesting, exciting jobs to go do this. That's who builds America, not some bureaucrat in the Department of Planning and Zoning in Washington, D.C. with some great idea and a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School at Harvard. It's the guy who risks his life savings that builds sure. America. Exactly. The guy, the street guy, he can do this. Listen, Art Laffer summarized the whole thing up so well. Why don't we listen to Art and then we can we can do a tail out. Joe Biden and some of his colleagues, you know, profess to love the poor so much that they want to make all of us poor. The dream in America has never been to make the rich poor. The dream in America has always been to make the poor richer. And Ronald Reagan always talked about balancing up. And the only way you balance up is by having pro-growth policies. No American is ever made better off by pulling a fellow American down. A rising tide, it raises all boats. And that is not the vision I see coming out of, uh, out of Joe Biden today. So, Tom, unfortunately, we are out of time, but we're going to have to have Art wrap up this section. <laughs> I think he summed it up well. Uh, well said. Exactly. Hey, we really appreciate you being on this on the show. Tom Jones, co-founder of the American Accountability Foundation. Thanks so much for having me. Folks, we have Renee Richardson coming on, associate director of All Within My Hands. Stay with us. Made in America. higher at the open stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day tuesday and i think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country now more of neil asbury's made in america
Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Rich, we are having an incredible show today. I just, you know, having Tom Jones, co-founder of American Accountability Foundation, uh, was really incredible. Not Tom Jones, the musician, but Tom Jones, the big thinker. Well, you had a good movie, 1968. You must be old. So anyway, that was fascinating. <laughs> and talking about television, I was in the Rockies. I just told you that uh, a moment ago. And I was, uh, you know, just it was really wonderful at night, you know, watching a couple of episodes of whatever. And I picked up Billions. Actually, my daughter picked up Billions and we're watching Billions. And uh, there's a scene there to where one of the, the lead actors uh, goes to a concert up in Canada somewhere and uh, to Metallica. He was a huge Metallica fan, this guy. He was a Evidently, a lot of people are huge right? Metallica fans. So he's, he's like at a private concert going there in this big arena, you know, and it's like really incredible. And, uh, and the lead guy for Metallica comes out, James Hetfield, and uh, they're kind of like talking there. It's a, it's a great conversation. And um, so it, it was really fascinating. I, I, I love seeing that. And then lo and behold, here we are, and we have... Renee Richardson, Associate Director of All Within My Hands, joining us right now. What does that have to do with Metallica? Well, Metallica is the 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 organization, the, the band that created All With All Within My Hands, a great organization. They started out by feeding people. I mean, a very important thing to do. But then uh, James uh, Hetfield really got into promoting the trades, and we always talk about mm -hmm. the trades here. You know, instead of going to some liberal arts school and getting a degree that doesn't mean anything. Go to trade school. Let me tell you, I'm a manufacturer. There's so many great paying jobs within the trades that are just not getting filled. Um, uh, uh, associate engineering jobs or, or CAD operators or machine well, electricians, operators. Electricians, plumbers, CNC, uh, HVAC operators. guys and ladies. This is so really much. big time. And so out of this, uh, the Metallica Scholars Initiative was born and uh, to help people go into trades, 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 great jobs, not getting fulfilled paying very well with great benefits. Renee, how was that as an introduction? Does that does that kind of sum it up a little bit about what you're up to? You guys are really good at this. You've done this before. You think? <laughs> it sums yeah. it up beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having, having me on to talk about this. Um, we're super excited about All Within My Hands and the work that we're doing, and specifically the work that we're doing with Carhartt. So I can't wait to tell you all and tell you everything. We'll, we'll go right ahead. You know, tell us, you know, what is the genesis of, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Metallica Scholars Initiative. Okay. All right. So um, we partnered, a, as you mentioned, the, the foundation um, was already starting to do work in the area of feeding the hungry, and then we got into the, the wanting to help the trade. And so we partnered with the American Association of Community Colleges and decided to work on a program with them because, you know, we're, they're a heavy metal band. They don't, do not know from community college work. <laughs> so we partnered with the AACC. We um, put out a very, um, uh, I don't want to say aggressive, but we, we opened up this opportunity to, in the first year, 10 community colleges had the opportunity to get $100,000 each from uh, All Within My Hands to promote trade education and support all of those trades you just mentioned, whether it be um, welding, truck driving, electrical work, um, uh, HVAC, all of it. And each of the schools that applied and ultimately got the grant were able to do really what they wanted. These were unrestricted funds and intended to support the community that the school was in. And these are communities that the band had recently toured in. So they, they had a focus on their fans, they had a focus on where they had recently been, and they had a, a, a focus on the trade. So we really let the schools dictate how best to, to use these funds, because in some areas it was more um, the trades in medical, in some areas it was the trades in trucking. And we are now, in year three, very proud to say that we're in 23 community colleges across the country. We have, in 2020 alone, we supported over a 1,000 uh, students in the program. And um, it varies from school to school, but we're very proud of this program. And since its inception, the band has donated $4.1 to this initiative. And I don't see it stopping. People are... People like Carhartt are getting involved and helping move it along. So we're very excited about, um, about Labor Day. Well, yeah, I mean, this is this is a, a terrific story to tell because this is really Thank giving you. back 
to the community and giving back to the nation and giving people an opportunity. You know, we, we've discussed, you know, years and years ago, people said you have to go to college. You have to go to college. If you go to, didn't go to college, people would look at you weird and say, what's wrong with you? Obviously, there's something wrong with you because you didn't go to college. But the truth of the matter is, you know, there are a lot of other things that we find out now. My God, you become an electrician, you're getting hundreds of dollars every time someone comes to my house to work on something. They all talk to each other. How much is it? Five hundred dollars. You know, yeah. or that's the electrical guy or the plumber guy will come in, you know, the following week to do something. And he'll do his little magic. And I'll say, well, how much do I owe you? Five hundred dollars. Did you talk to the other guy last week? Because you guys are doing five hundred dollars an hour. You know, that sounds yeah. like an attorney for me. This is this is really. Really, really good stuff. But you know what? I really, I, I really appreciate um, the, the the idea that they. I understand roadies well because I toured for a while back in the day in the, in the late sixties yeah. and seventies. And as a matter of fact, one of my closest friends, who's unfortunately deceased, is Ronnie James Dio. Ronnie and I were in upstate New York together. Oh, we all played. Yeah. And when he, when I knew yeah. him was Roddy Padavona, and he had every, uh, Ronnie Dio and the Prophets, and then it went on from there. Elfs and other bands. We met Richie Blackmore. Got into Rainbow for a while. Eventually got into Black Sabbath. And and that's my connection to you know to heavy metal music. But these guys are just terrific, and I'm, I am just so delighted that you people are able to do that. Upstaging, working with the transportation company for production and so forth, this is a big business. And it's really cool mm-hmm. that they're giving people the opportunity, because when we toured, I'm telling you, you try and move a voice of theater you know, sound system that's huge. Uh, it takes a lot of people, and you give people the opportunity to, you know, feel good about what they're doing and do well in an industry that's growing dramatically with some pretty cool people. Yeah, so uh, Renee, I mean, it's it's. I mean, that Rich kind of summed up the whole industry there, and 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 the jobs and the things that are out there uh, for people who want to join. Absolutely incredible. Hey, uh, tell tell James and the band that we really appreciate what he's doing. I mean, feeding the people, I mean, that's incredible. But promoting the trades, I mean, that's near and dear to our heart here at Made in America. We want to bring our jobs back home. And people like James, Metallica, Renee, all within my hands, are doing a great job of helping to train our people to have a better life and build a more prosperous America. Renee, thanks for being on the show. And don't forget to shop at, at uh, Carhartt because on Labor Day, they're giving 100% of sales to the foundation. And this is all going right to the Metallica Scholars Initiative. So please support and thank you guys uh, from the bottom of our hearts for, for having us on. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I still have a lot more to talk about. A lot, a lot happened this week. We're, we're not nearly done. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Really cool story about Metallica. Really cool story about Metallica. Remember, you know, we had uh, uh, Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull and, you know, his 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 representative talking about... He was helping making, the military. Helping the military by, what were they doing? They were making hand sanitizer. Yeah. And well, uh, he's, ma- he's doing well now. To help the, 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 <laughs> the, the military and the police. And the police in America and the military in America. And then Charlie Daniels, wasn't he a, a uh, great guy? I mean, he's been with us and talked about, you know, his greatest accomplishment in life was being an entrepreneur and, and employing people. His music was great, but his music was a way to employ people and to create jobs. And he talked about how 25, 30 people were employed by him throughout his career on a, on a, on a continuous basis. Yeah. He watched their children grow up and all he, of that. And that, that gave him more happiness. That gave, you know, it, he was such a down-to-earth guy yeah. when we spoke to him a few times. He was a really nice man. I was very sad when he passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I felt it personally. I and like and it. and we were just re- to reach out to him to do a, to do a, a, a visit with us and and uh, he had written something we had saw in the in the paper, and he was talking about bringing American jobs back. And before we can get to him, he had passed a uh, terrible, terrible loss for America. And then Metallica, of all people, you know, helping Americans get into trade school and promoting trade schools. I mean, where did that come from? I mean, absolutely amazing. I'm not necessarily a fan of Metallica, but as of today, I'm a big fan of Metallica for doing for doing that. And James well, Hetfield doing m- musicians. What he's done. Musicians are very giving people, uh, generally speaking. You know, we were talking about Ronnie on Ronnie James Dio. Well, 
you know, it's really interesting. Ronnie, Ronnie had a band that played all the covers and everything, and he was his voice was exactly like Tom Jones. His range was unbelievable. Best voice, best band. I mean, incredible. And then one weekend, he, he and, the, and his band went up to the Boston area, and they had a head-on collision, and the lead guitar player, Nicky Panis, was killed. And after that, Ronnie completely went dark. He got very strange. We did all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerts to raise money for the family so they would have money going forward. But Ronnie went dark, and he went, went right from there into, into heavy metal. And, and, and that was the time for me to recognize that he was going through this incredible change. But musicians are giving people. They're very, very giving people, you know? Amazing. Amazing. There's some still wonderful stories out there, folks. There's wonderful stories, despite everything our country is going through right now. There's wonderful stories about how our entrepreneurs are giving back to the community. Absolutely incredible. It's not like you got to tax them to death so there are no entrepreneurs to give back to the community. They will do it on their own. And they will create more wealth and more wealth as long as we let them. And that brings us to what's happening with this rent moratorium, you know, just like, you know, there's so many entrepreneurs and they're engaged in many different things. And there's millions and millions of Americans, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans that have 401ks and they're invested in the stock market. And, you know, that's the way they retire and they enjoy their their days with their grandchildren or doing whatever they're going to do, going out around the world and or just staying home and, and pursuing their passions. Um, but the American economy is so important to our prosperity. And part of that uh, economy is letting our small businesses and our individual people, our citizens, invest in real estate. And how many, how many Americans are invested in real estate? They just scrounge up a little money and, and they put it into a real estate investment and they, and they get some rent. And then after a while, they get encouraged to go on to the next. Uh, Rich, let's listen to Clarence. Uh, Hamer. He's a small New York City landlord, and he's talking about the rent moratorium and what it's doing to him as a small business person. And this was on Fox and Friends the other day. Well, I'm owed over $65,000. My tenant hasn't paid since August of 2019. And do I, uh, I, I know that I can sue or go through litigation in court, but I do not expect any of that money. We can't take him to court. We, we still have to provide maintenance heat, hot water, gas, maintenance, all of that. And it's coming right out of our pockets. So, Rich, I mean, how, how can you do that? How can you do that to somebody? I mean, to some person who scrounged everything together to have that property so he can somehow cash flow it to at least break even. He can't do that anymore. Well, he's, he's hoping you, you invest in real estate because you buy it at low and you try and sell it at high. So you develop equity. So they're all trying to do that. That's all part of the American dream. That's all part of the American dream. But, but Neil, where do we allow government to make a rule that y you have to give up your property? Because a lot of these small landlords are, are losing their property because they can't pay the mortgage that they have on the property. And yet the irony of the whole thing is the renter, who's now a squatter, can't leave the property, doesn't have to leave the property. You have to go through court to get that person out. It is a very uncomfortable situation and enormously unfair thinking that everybody is a rich cat who owns all this property. Not true. Yeah, I mean, and, and what, what is these properties going to do? They're going to start deteriorating. I mean, he says he has to pay for the gas. He has to pay for the electric bills. they got to provide heat, uh, hot water, and all of that. And where that where's that money coming from? He's got to pay for maintenance. But where's the maintenance gonna coming come from? Coming out of his pocket. Well, this it's poor guy's be, paying for well, it. Well, he's not going to have the money. Every week. He's not going to have the money to pay for it. That's these right. buildings are going to start deteriorating and become unsafe. So, again, the unintended consequences that happen – when the government steps in, Big Brother steps in and, and says, OK, uh, Mr. Landlord, person, small business person, you know, you, you, we're going to crush you. We're just going to absolutely crush you uh, because we can do that. And that's the power that we have. And, uh, you know, so you got a building. You now you got no rent. You got squatters. And this is a major, major disaster. We're just it's already happening. It's not like waiting to happen. Hey, Rich, uh, we got uh, we, we got to take a quick break, but uh, we're going to be back uh, with a very, very important topic uh, that's come out of this Afghanistan thing. 
that really is going to impact our economy. Folks, stay with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, you know, we talk a lot about global trade. I mean, global trade is so fundamentally important to our to our country. Exports, our, our exports, uh, dollar for dollar, they employ five times more people than our imports do. Mm-hmm. Exports are very important. Hey, let's face it, 75% of the world's wealth and 95% of the world's population is not in the United States is not in the United States. That means the vast majority of wealth is outside the United States. America has to compete. We have to be part of that. I personally believe that that uh, the vast majority of the, the, the world's wealth still hasn't been created. It's still out there. It's not yet created. So where are we going to create that wealth? Who's going to create that wealth? Is it going to be America? Is it going to be our entrepreneurs? Is it going to be folks outside of our country? And then all of that tax base and all of that is going to invest in countries other than our own. So it's it's so important that America has access to the global market. And we talk about we talk about that a lot. I mean, how, how important it is. But let's listen to this soundbite by Nigel Farage. Uh, he recently made this comment, uh, a very important uh, a member of the of the British uh, political establishment talking about what he believes is a betrayal by the United States of the UK and the EU and what that means to stability and what it means to trade and prosperity. Listen to this. The whole of the G7 begging Joe Biden to extend the deadline, but no, 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 because the Taliban and ISIS have threatened an American president, and he's decided to dance to their tune. And so if we do find ourselves back engaged, and, and you know, let's be honest, the last few years we've not seen major terrorist atrocities in the West, but if they start to happen again, and we start to think, well, how do we go out again and try and stop these cells that are spreading international terror, how can we do it with the Americans? How can we do it with an ally that has treated us with contempt and betrayed us and into the bargain many of our own citizens. Uh, uh, Certainly, if it's a Biden or Harris administration, honestly, there is no way, there is no way a British parliament right now would vote for military cooperation with America led by this administration. That's an amazing indictment. That's amazing. And and what you're talking about, the whole relationship, the economic relationship, and what happens, you know, if, you know, this thing, you know, I, I don't even want to say it, but if something terrible would have happened in some, he's right, it, it, you know, businesses and entrepreneurs has, has been able to go out there and, and, and really, I mean, of course, we got COVID and we got the supply chain issues and we got all of that but going on. But there is stability. But there is at least stability from from terrorists. Act. That's right. What, exactly right. What, what if now we had to throw that into the mix of our economy after we are struggling so hard? And let me tell you, folks, our entrepreneurs really have it tough right now. What's happening with the global supply chain, what's happening with getting our economy back going with COVID, it's really, really rough out there. And and now we have this to contend with? Well, it's also interesting. You know, uh, the president was actually condemned on the floor of parliament uh, a week ago. Uh, Very, very upset. Both parties agree. There was no separation of thought. But, you know, Nigel Farage, um, and we all know him, we've seen him on TV so much with Brexit, but he was the leader of the Brexit party from 2019 to 2021 in England, and he was also the leader of the UK Independence Party very in, in London, in England, a very, very influential man, a man who's out front often speaking about relationships it was relationship, that very special relationship that we had with the UK, that we had with the EU. And as a result of a unilateral, non-discussed decision 
made by this administration, primarily Joe Biden, we have betrayed. That's the word they used. Betrayed our friends. And I've got to tell you something. That will affect the trade that we do with these countries, Neil, because trade is based on loyalty and trust and honor and, and the ability to work together. And we just haven't seen that for the last few weeks, the way it's come down. This is a very frightening statement, but a very pointed statement from a very knowledgeable man. And I don't know, is, is this what it means that America is back? Is this what it means that America is back? Well, Rich, you know, I'm with you. You know, this is a, a very difficult time. Our entrepreneurs are being challenged and like they've never done before. And they just can't take it another another sort of global event to hit them because I, I don't know what will happen. We're at a very, very fragile time right now in getting our economy and our prosperity and, and, and getting it back to where we're operating in a much more normal, predictable manner. And uh, let me tell you, it can go either way. It's, it's scary. It's scary as hell. Rich, unfortunately, we're out of time. But we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your jobs.